I feel like, it, it just becomes, you know. <laughs> Let me tell you the truth about Hollywood. Right, right, right. <laughs> Here's what you're doing wrong there. Like, well, I'm back to my shop, cheese shop that I have to work at all day. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, uh, but it, it, is a, it is a great time. It, and it's really, you guys, if you go, if you go there, if, you, if, you, if you're a student at all of this, uh, and you go for the three days, you know, it'll blow your head off how yeah. much stuff you learn there. Well, just working here as well, you know, we're confined to right. one room. Um, oh, that factor. That, are you still going to be? Are you still at Regent's College, or, or no? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but it's just like there's stuff that goes. It's so varied and it's so mm -hmm. like intense. Right. Uh, we were doing 14-hour days, and yeah. we're volunteers, so we're just right. like right. running on empty. You know? Right. Just like, I did the other thing. I did was the speed pitching. Yeah. Oh yeah. Speed pitching is crazy. Is that the elevator pitch, or is it? Uh, I don't know. It was in a big room, oh, okay. and there was a bunch of tables. It really was sort that of was like the speed dating. Speed pitch fest. That was yeah. the, la the Great British Pitch Fest. That was no, no, no. That was part of the. This was part of the the, the yeah, screen. They brought it over and they just oh, moved all right. So pitch. they come in. I sit at a table, and you go, "Hi, my name is Oza, and here's my thing. It's an animated thing." Blah, blah, and they go for ten minutes yeah, or something. Yeah, that's what's happening tomorrow in here. Yes. In this room. Holy shit! Yeah. That is crazy because you, you you've got to be locked in. Yeah. Five minutes to get. Five, five, five minutes. Yeah. We've got bells. And, and you know, and listen, I you know, the thing that I said to some people that were there is like you know not taking up their time uh, when it was my time to talk was the hardest part about pitching is pitching. Okay, I mean, you know your story's in your head. You, I mean, you have it, right? It's just like, okay, tell me it right away. But no, make it really short. You, you have all this stuff, it's like it gets crunched up into your head, right, at, like, you know, at the last second. So you can't get it out. It's about a guy. All right, so he's kind of like Mel Gibson, but not the crazy Mel Gibson. And, and you start to do this, and all of a sudden you're five minutes into saying who he's not, right? And you just, Ding. yeah, and then they go, oh. That's what Luke okay. was saying. Luke was yeah. saying, just practice, 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 practice. Yeah. Right. So here they've got like the pitch boot camp going right. on where and they'll seven. literally be moving around and, and, and it never it never gets I mean some people can really pitch and then they come out, you know. I one time had a, I one time had a, a pitch at Warner Brothers with this uh, big producer and she said and I said I, I just kinda said to her, I'm not a great pitcher. I can write, but I'm not a great pitcher because I get caught up in the details or something. And she says, No, this is this is my theory. Guys who are great pitchers are not good writers. I found that. They can really tell a story, but they can't get down and tell it, right? So then we walk in and we pitch this story to, to the executive at Warner Brothers. And we walk out and she goes, hey, you're a pretty good pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wait a minute. So am I? Which means you're not a good writer. And I didn't get the job. And I didn't get the job. So there you go. So, oh boy. Yeah, so it was... Um, but pitching, it never gets, and especially if, you, you know, we get into these things and you're passionate about your story, right? Is that you really want them to know your story so much. I want to get it right. Like, oh, I can see it, right? That, that's the problem. It's the people who are sort of, like, if you go in with a, a producer or, you know, a manager or whoever else you go in there with, they could, they could tell your pitch in a second. And there's a yeah. point where you go, he, he knows it <laughs> because he's not attached to it. I mean, he goes, oh, no, it's about a guy. He meets us this. They go to a magical world. They come this. And they, and they go, oh, it's just like Raiders of the Lost Ark. And they go, huh. And then I'm still going, it's sort of the, oh, all right, you know Mel Gibson when he was, uh, <laughs> and you're just going, and you're still trying to pinpoint the guy. And he goes, sometimes he'll say a word, and, it sound, and people won't understand him, and that becomes something else, you know. And, uh, and you get caught in the weeds, right? right? And so the hardest part about pitching is to just relax. I mean, and I know, because you want to sell it. Is, and they sell, just relax. It's almost like you need to be sort of on a tranquilizer. That's a really funny circumstance, actually, in the last LSF where we had a thing called elevator pitch. Right. So oh, it's as like if... super... Right, you know, right. So they're in, like, a, it's a small elevator as well. So they're in this <laughs> tiny space. Wait, so are you, like, standing? So yeah. you're standing. So you're having producer, sex with them at the same time. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Taking their watch off. From the top to the bottom to do your pitch, right? And so people are doing this all day, and they queue up to do it. Crazy. Wait, wait, but what, what do you what do you just you go into a booth and I time you for thirty you go seconds into or something? And you you go go oh, you go into a literally. Oh my god! Literally go into How many floors are we talking? Five so floors. we're talking five floors or so. So they go in, they go up to the top, and they go down to the bottom. Are you and that's kidding? It. 
like about one of them, um, we had Mike Lee arrive, right? Right. Mike Lee. Um, Mike Lee I, did it. If you don't know, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, he, yeah, he um, I can't imagine he, he got a pitch came, out. Well, no, he didn't. But he he was going up to the green room, and we did, he's quite an old guy. Right, right. And I didn't want to make him do all the stairs, so we got him in the lift. <laughs> right while there were pictures going on. So this poor guy was pitching his idea and then, you know, the doors open and Mike Lee walks in and he's just like, ah. <laughs> oh my God, it's and literally like kryptonite. Crazy. Like you're done. Yeah, you've got to be, you know, nerves of steel to deal with that. Oh kind of my pressure. gosh. And it's literally a four person elevator. It's tiny. Right. On the other hand, who else got pitched to Mike Lee? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. Well, really, inadvertently. Right, you, right. But right. You, right. You, like yeah. he passed us as he was going into the lift and, and you could hear him going, this is a horrible idea, you know, poor, <laughs> right. poor people. How are you well, you know, I mean, I guess like any good movie that's when it's done, you can pitch it in an elevator, right? Yeah. You can kind of go, oh, right, that's, you know, it's this and this and this, you know. But when you're trying to put it together because you kind of want to tell the whole story, you know, you're married to the whole story. You know, if you say, you know, if you said like Finding Nemo is about a, you know, a dad who loses his son, you know, and uh, he has, to, he has, he can't find him, and the only person that can help him has the car, basically, and uh, she's short-term memory, she can't remember, you know, like that. It's like, and you're stuck, you're stuck with that person, right? So you can, you, you, you can, and oh, and by the way, they're fish, you know, and so you kind of layer that on top. Oh, did I tell you that they're fish? And then you cut to Nemo, and he says he's in this tank, and blah blah blah, and they said. Uh, and when he gets in there, he finds out that all the other fish are, are planning a jailbreak. Like anytime you say, oh, oh, that's pretty funny. You know, so you can kind of get it, but you got to kind of write the whole movie first in order to get yeah. that, you know? It's, it's, a weird, it's a weird way because some people can distill their ideas very quickly. But the thing is, as writers, we all try to, you know, make every moment count. So you go, I'm not, why am I giving weight to those big beats when I know you know, it, it's, it's all going to be good, right? right? Dave, how did you get started in Conan? I mean, I know that was your first, your, oh, on Late Night with Conan right. that was your first job, right? Right, right, at Conan. Um, that was back in 93. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Many of you were very young then. Um, and I was a mere 12-year-old uh, <laughs> who just had a dream and some sketches. No, I, um, I actually... Um, I was here in LA and I had been writing uh, spec scripts, half hour TV spec scripts for a long time, you know, a couple years. And uh, they were getting some traction and I knew some people and I had a, at the time I had a Seinfeld script, uh, a script, a spec script of Seinfeld and a spec script of The Simpsons actually. You know, cause I try, if you're writing spec scripts, I don't know if any of you guys are still, try to vary them unless, unless you have a specific type that you want to do, right? I mean, unless you have a specific, you know, thing that you can really write, then stick to that. But if, but if, you know, if, uh, a Seinfeld and Simpsons are two comedies and they're two, you know, so you can kind of, you can kind of see how they both can work, you know, with different tones, right? So I had those out and they were getting some traction and I was just trying to get, I was trying to get an, a, you know, you're trying to get an agent, you're trying to get anything. And um, I had a few early, uh, years earlier through a friend of mine, Robert Smigel, who at the time was a writer on Saturday Night Live. Um, I had met this young guy, Conan O'Brien, when he was you know, on Saturday Night Live, and then he came out and was working on The Simpsons. So then I, that's one of the reasons I said, hey, I have a, a guy I kind of know on The Simpsons. So I wrote a Simpsons. So what I did, and I don't, if anyone's writing uh, specs of a certain show, get as many of those scripts as you can and figure out how they do it. Because each show has a different pattern. Like Seinfeld had a pattern where they didn't overwrite, um, they didn't overwrite the stage description, and I figured that out very quickly because uh, you know if you remember the show, Kramer would come in and he would slip and he'd slide, and he'd do this all this stuff, and then he would end and he'd go, "Hey, Jared," like that, and he'd be like that, he'd go, "Hey, Jared," <laughs> like like you know, like he'd do that, right? But it, people when they were writing their spec scripts would write all his moves. Okay, now the Seinfeld staff says we don't care. He knows how to get in through the door. You know, uh, Michael Richards will figure that out. We'll figure that out. So you just say, Kramer enters in a hurry. He'll figure it out, right? You don't need to, you, some things you don't need to tell him unless it's specific to the story, okay? Unless the action that you're describing later pays off or trips the guy up or does something, don't need it, right? 
it's in your head, and you, you can say it's colorful and whatever, you know. Um, and so anyway, I had that Seinfeld script going, and then, and uh, so two things were happening. One was I sent my Seinfeld script to Robert Smigel at Saturday Night Live because Jerry Seinfeld was the host. So Jerry Seinfeld said, you know, he, he literally, as a friend, he goes, could you read this to my friends in L.A.? And he goes, it's pretty funny. And he goes, so Jerry turned to Larry David. And he goes, could you read this? And, and Larry David turned to Larry Charles. And Larry, and Larry David says, read this. So anyway, that was it. And I go, listen, you got it in their hands. They at least touched my script, so I don't care. And then, um, so that was happening. While that was happening, I was home writing the Simpsons script. And so um, I, was, uh, I was writing that, and in hopes of getting it in good enough shape that I can give it to the, my friend at the Simpsons, Conan O'Brien, who was at the time the rising star of the Simpsons. If you, if you know anything about the history of that show, he came in in the, like the third season or so and just blew the doors off an all-star uh, writing, uh, writing staff. And they, to this day, will say he was the guy who came in and, you know, just, I mean, but the, all those guys are really great. So anyway, two things were happening. So it, another sort of side note of this is, like, you're, you're, hit, you're trying to hit on every front. Any, any angle you have, any friend you have, any contact you have, without being a jerk, without being, you just say, could you take a look at this? Would you, or do you know somebody who could read this? Could you do this, right? And so I was doing that, and, I, and you know, so two things happened. One was, three or four months later, I'm, I'm at my apartment and the phone rings. And, and, and I guess Dave Reynolds, I said, yeah. I said, this is Larry Charles. And I said, oh, hi. You know, I was working, you know, I'm, my day job is working at a wine store. I mean, I'm working at a wine store in Hancock Park. And, you know, and I had the day off. And I just answered the phone. And, and, it's, and it's Larry. He goes, yeah, listen, you wrote a Seinfeld script? I said, yeah. How do I have this? How did I get it? And I said, uh, Robert Spiegel, maybe? And he goes, oh, right, right. Hey, listen, I got to tell you something. This is really good. I went, oh, thanks. But then, he's, then the, the, the other shoe drops. He says, we're you know, in the middle of staffing. We don't know what our deals are. We know that. Um, so we can't hire you right now. But you can tell your agent that um, you have an assign, uh, a, a Seinfeld script that's been approved by me, by the Seinfeld producer. Like, it's a good one. He goes, because there's a lot of bad ones out there. And he was just, and we started talking for a little bit. <clears throat> and I said, oh, really? And he goes, so anyway, what, you nailed it. This is really, we would do this script. And I went, oh, well, cool, thanks. I hang up. It was the greatest call I ever got in my life that sort of gave me nothing, right? It's kind of like, you know, oh, I did it. Oh, you know, like, now what? <laughs> Go back to work at the wine store, right? So. I sort of, I was on the fence, I was trying to get an agent. This all kind of ties together the whole thing. And at the same time, I was still writing my Simpsons script. So you're trying to write on as many fronts, as I say, as, as you can. And I had my, um, I had my script into Conan, to, and you know, and he, when he would get up, he was doing 15 hour days, and when he got a minute, he was gonna read it. So all this stuff started happening, and I got an agent, and I said, listen, you know, uh, Larry Charles liked my script, and he goes, does he want to buy it? I said, what? No, he can't. He goes, well, all right. And he hangs up, literally hangs up on me. I was like, oh my gosh. I, I, mean, like, I mean, that was, you know, because whatever. So then I called another guy up. I had these two agents I was trying to get. And, this other guy, and I said, listen, um, you know, this, they like the Seinfeld script. Oh, and I have a script over at the Simpsons, like this. And then they didn't understand that I just had a friend reading it. They thought I had a script over there. So they signed me. <laughs> so they signed me, and it was like, wait, we're, I thought you had a deal with The Simpsons. I said, no, no, I told you I had a script over there. And, you know, anyway, were they but, pissed off? Well, no, be, no, they didn't get a chance to be pissed off, because in the meantime, Conan was offered the job of, of uh, you know, late night. Uh, he was, I was friends with him. We went to, I went to the audition that he had at NBC, and all of a sudden, he, you know, he gets offered the job. And then my friend Robert Smigel, who was at Saturday Night Live, was asked to be the producer with him. He calls me up, or he comes into town for this thing, and he, and he comes up to me and he says, uh, do you want to do, do this show with us? And I said, what, the Conan show? Where, is, it's going to be in New York, right? And, I, and he says, yeah. And I go, I don't know, Rob. You know, like, you're like, I go, it's in New York. I got all my stuff here. You know, like, and you're like my wife and my dogs are here, and we're really in a great apartment. And he was like, because I've known him for a long time, he goes, no, I get it. It's just, you know. I thought it'd be fun. And I said, uh, yeah, and we talked about the show. 
and what we would do if we were on it. And, but he goes, no, I get it. Plus, I was getting traction with the Simpsons script, right? And, you know, they kind of liked it at the time. Somebody over there liked it. So I thought, well, why move all the way across country when I can get a job right here on this, like, a fantastic show on the, you know, and um, against a show that no one knows. And so then you think about it for a little while. And then, and then I come home, and it's about 1 in the morning. This is, I'm telling you, way too much. At 1 in the morning, I, come, I wake my wife up. I'm sitting on the bed, and, she, and she's like, all right, what's wrong? I, and I tell her what Robert offered me, and she goes, uh-huh. I go, I just made a huge mistake, right? You know, I feel like I'm arrested development, right? I just made a, big, I just made a huge mistake. And, and she goes, yeah, I think you did. And I go, how many times do you get a chance to start a show from the ground up? You know, a TV show, you put your stamp on it, that whole thing. All right, I'm calling him the next day. So I call him the next morning, and he goes, yeah, I kind of figured you'd sleep on You know, so, so, so then I had to, uh, but it wasn't a given, so I had to write, and this is another thing you had to do. I had to write sample packets. And sample packets uh, for, were sketches, uh, ideas. There, you know, it was Smigel and uh, Robert Smigel and Conan O'Brien, who are two tremendous writers. I mean, just, I mean, they're the greatest writers you're ever going to see. Still, to the, the best writer, on, one of the best writers on Conan's show is Conan. He's just fantastically gifted. So, I had to write sample packets of what his show could be, and it was going to be a little different than it, it couldn't be Letterman. It wasn't going to be Leno. It was going, to, you know. So we had to create a whole new show. And here's the thing: we were going to be in Letterman's old studio. Now, if you remember back, any of you are old enough, to, you can remember. But, yeah, sadly, you and I are the only two. Right, right. So anyway, the um, we were going to be in 6A. We we're going to be in Letterman Studio. Uh, the, the whole everything that you grew up watching Letterman do, we were going to be in that studio. Okay, with a new guy, with a new guy trying to do a new show. And we're huge fans of his, of Letterman's. So we had to create uh, a different template. We wanted to do sort of like the old Steve Allen show. We wanted to do fake guests. We wanted to do bits. We wanted to do bits with actors, you know, uh, like in, in the middle of interviews, we, we tried to do a, a, some sort of comedy bit. Or, you know, we were going to pack the show with comedy. And one of the reasons was is that Conan just said, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to do a talk show. I mean, he had never done, I mean, he could talk and he could interview, but. It's, there's a gift and there's a talent to that, that you know. So, anyway, that's what we did. So, in 93, I wrote, I wrote uh, four or five different packets of everything you can imagine. Sketches, lists, what ifs, you know, remote segments, everything, and just kept writing it. And I kept sending it to Smigel and those guys, with well, every other comedy writer <clears throat> in the country. And so, because I knew those guys, NBC said, well, you're not going to hire your friends. So, I had to write, like, three times what everybody else did because I know another writer got hired he goes yeah I just had like six pages it was kind of half done you know like I, you know but any, anyways it all worked out great and then we I go there in 93 we go in and um, we did we come in there in July of 93 so, so it's what 20 years this year and so we go in there um, and immediately say can't do what Dave does can't do anything that Letterman did so if you say, if you go down and you see the setup there Hey, what if Conan comes out with a can that Letterman did it? What if we did a thing in the elevator that Letterman did it? So we had three months of that. Three months of everybody for 14 hours a day pitching ideas and getting shot down. Mm. So you, because you had to develop your own Conan's style. And one of the things that Robert and, and, he, and Conan did was they supported him with comedy. So if, if, if you watch Letterman or Leno or something, you have an opening monologue then they come back and you have a desk piece, and then you have a first guest that usually goes two segments, and then you have a, an, uh, an act three piece, and then you, you, and you're out. So you have three pieces of comedy. So then usually you have monologue writers do the monologue, and then you can do the, de you do the desk piece, and then you do the act three, you know, which is after the first guest. And so we would have two sets, so, but when we were trying to do it, we would do five to six pieces of comedy. We would do funny titles. We would do a joke within the, mo uh, within the opening announcement of the show. We would do a uh, monologue. We'd do a desk piece. We would do a piece with the first guest. We would do act three. We'd do funny credits. We'd do anything we could. So we'd do five to six pieces of comedy. There was s six writers, seven writers, with, with uh, Andy Richter. Seven writers. And we would do that, and we did that five shows a week. For the first, I, well, for the first two years, so I don't, whatever that was, 450 shows or something like that. So 
you, any, like if I met any one of you guys in the middle of this, and I talked to you for five minutes, I would try to suck something out of your life <laughs> and make it, make it into a bit. I, you know what I mean? I, all of a sudden, it, it, like if you talked about your crazy aunt, I go, Conan's got a crazy aunt. Okay, she comes and she won't stop. And then we, somebody did that, and we did. All of a sudden, Conan was in the middle of an interview, and all of a sudden, you hear knock, 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 and all of a sudden, Conan? Aunt Vanita, like Louis C.K. came up with this idea of this woman, this aunt, she is this uh, sassy aunt that just came in and just, you know, it was like she was from a 70s sitcom. And she just came in and goes, oh, come on. Like in the middle of an interview. I mean, it was just like, because we, we, we had to forge uh, uh, sort of like his, his, uh, his personality and his comedy. And so we did that. And, and any, so, so if I would have met any of you guys, I would have suck the marrow out of you just to get anyway you talk about what incredibly long days it was yes I mean, did you just get burned out after the two years or yeah everybody everybody once we got over the hump of Conan being accepted because now we were going 13 weeks you know stretches five shows a week okay and all during those 13 weeks all the newspapers who's Conan why is he on TV Let's get rid of him. You know, he's not funny. He's not Letterman. But I guess. So you just get that. That's when you go to work. That's what you're hearing all the time. Okay? So you had to go to work. So I would tell my wife, I said, don't read the New York Times or the New York Daily News or the Post or anything. She goes, yeah, that's easy. So she would only read the New York Times, which didn't have that kind of stuff. So anyway, we, uh, you'd come in there and there would be, you know, there was, as I said, six writers, there's three monologue writers that sort of worked on their own, and then and Conan and, and Smigel. So we would come in, and we would come in about 10 o'clock, 9.30 every morning, and kind of go through what we were trying to do, and then there'd be a meeting at noon, and then we would be working on bits. And you were constantly working on bits. And you would work on today's show, what's going on for the next couple shows, things that you have to do in the future, and... Um, and if you have to go videotape anything, go take a crew out, you would edit. They let you produce all your pieces, so was, that was kind of great. And, um, but, excuse me, we would leave about 2 in the morning. And then you're back there the next day at 9.30, 10 o'clock. And, the, you know, so, so you would do that, and then Friday you would just kind of shake. You know, you'd just be done, and then you would, I would want to sleep all weekend. But we were, my wife was like, come on, we're going to go see New York. Oh, so we had to see the city. You live, because I would just shuttle. I wouldn't even care. You just wanted to sleep. And then you'd have 13 weeks in, you'd have a week off. And invariably, everyone on the staff would be sick that entire week. Your, your body would just let down. You'd be sick. And then that's about that Saturday before you go back. Go, hey, I'm feeling pretty good. Hey, you know, on Sunday, you feel great. You go, oh, I'm back to work. And here we go. And here we are. We're back in it for another 13-week stretch. So we did that, you know, as I said, we would just do it, you know, 45 weeks out of the year or whatever it was. And, you know, just, you know, it was just pounding it. But the, the thing was, as I said about, and anything was open. So, and we were trying to stay, when you're doing a show that comes on at 1230 at night or 1130 in the central time, but 1230 at night, we shoot it at 530 that day, right? So you want to stay about as up to, up to date as you can, right? So anything that happens by, you know, with our, anything that happens by 529, is, is eligible to be in that show, right? Right? And Robert would just, Robert Smigel, who is a crazy, funny, hilarious writer, would just go, we're changing it now, now. And, you know, the band is playing. I mean, we had those things where, <laughs> swear to God, you know, Max Weinberg 7 is out there playing the band, you know, the warm-up. And we are, all the writers are in the, in the hallway, literally scribbling, like, ideas on, and there's a cue card person waiting like this, and you're like... You know, like do this and Conan come by and goes, okay, go, 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 go. I mean, it's like broadcast news. Yes, wow. I mean, it literally, and I, I, I'm sorry, but yeah. this, this did, this happened several times that we had an editing bay that was on the second floor and we were on the sixth floor. So you would come up these stairs and come by. Now, I can remember having a videotape for the opening monologue, had to be ready. And they're down there and because of some things, the editor was not getting the tape right. It was like, they're, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. You need, and then you're like, cut the two sides, cut the two sides. All right, give me the time. And you're like, and you're, you become this kind of crazed monkey. You're going, give me the time codes, which means those are the numbers that the guy has to sync it up for, right? 
And so all you're doing is going eight seven eight seven eight seven eight seven eight seven eight 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 seven eight, and you're running like a madman, and you're running up with this big, you know, thing, and you're running up the stairs. And the greatest part about that is, if it's your piece, that you produce it, right? So you produce it, you shoot it, you cut it, you sweep it, everything, you do it. So that's great. It's on you, but it's on you. I mean, it's good. So, but when it's not, when you're not in that show, uh, you, if, if that's not you working there, you have nothing to do at 5:30. You get, you, that's your one hour off, right? So you go, you know, but if you're doing a piece in the show, you gotta go make sure the props are right or the tape's queued up or the sound effects are all cool, right? So I can remember, and this is so vivid, I come up the stairwell and I'm cutting across to get to the control room and then the main hallway is like this, so you have to cut across it. So you're cutting across like this and it's like broadcast, you cut across this and you turn and look and there's like four or five other writers who aren't in the show. They're, this is their time off. Dino Stamatopoulos, Louis C.K., and they're all going, hi, Dave. Like this, like this. And you're like, uh, your eyes or your head's blown back, and you're like, then you come in and you just, you come in and you hear the band. So when you come into the control room, now you hear the whole feed of the show. And you hear all the cameramen talking, you hear everybody, there, and you blow past them to the guy, and the guy is, takes it, and you're just going, you're like, like, a, like Rain Man, 877, and you're just giving them, the, you're giving them the encode. The guy is dialing it up, 8774, 87, and they're like, and they go, and, they dip, 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 and then they zip it up, and they go, okay. And so then you go, okay. And then the show goes, and now you sit there and you stare at this thing to make sure that it goes on right. Like, you like the thing that you just worked on all night till two in the morning, all day, you know, up until the show. And then you, if this guy doesn't press the button at the right time, you're gonna kill him, right? <laughs> and, then, and, like this, and you're just like this, and you go, boom, and it goes off. And this is, when you work on a show that big and that, you know, that many shows um, that, and, and you know, huge, hilariously funny. Right or it goes over well, you get you don't get anything. You go, okay. What are you doing next? Like that? Like what? what are you, aren't you doing uh, funny postcards for tomorrow's show? Yeah, they need you in graphics. Let's go. And that was it. So the only time you really hurt, and it, it's the way it should be. It's like the only time you ever hear anything is when what happened with that tape? Where was the cue, sound cue? Why did that you know delay a second? You know because they needed to be perfect. So you never heard of anything until, unless you've screwed up. I mean, it's, it sounds a little twisted, but you go, you can't be sitting there patting everybody on the back the whole time, hey, super jump, great, you know. I mean, every once in a while you get a, hey, you get a thumb, that was funny, you know, like, and that would be it. Like the most hilarious thing in the world where somebody's rolling in the aisles, like they're talking about it for days, and they go, oh yeah, that bit was funny, yeah. Anyway, so, <laughs> but that was what it was like all the time. Great. But I'll tell you, the last thing I'll tell you, and this is how it was, as far, you get into a rhythm and uh, where if um, we got out at, say, 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, that was getting off early, okay? I would call my wife at, like, 8. I said, hey, I think we're getting off at, like, 9.30 or quarter to 10. You want to go out to dinner? Like, at 10, and she goes, yeah, well, so it would be more like 11, 10.30 or 11 o'clock, right? And she goes, sure, let's, you know, we would never go out to dinner. It's a place in New York and go out to dinner anytime you want, right? So... We're all going to the, it was, it was 10.30, we're all so psyched, and we're at 10 o'clock, we're going out to the door, and I'll never forget this. This is before cell phones, I don't know how old I am. But before anyone had cell phones, so a couple of writers uh, got on the elevator and got out. I know who they are, too. They got out. And uh, two or three of us were standing there waiting for the next elevator. We were just going to go down together and take the subway, or whatever it was. And writers were getting, I mean, literally pressed the button, waiting for the elevator door, is about to open. Writer's assistant busts through and says, Michael Jackson just married Elvis' daughter. And we go, oh. <laughs> oh, everybody drops their bags. I go, you're kidding. You're joking. Nope, they just got married. Priscilla Presley just put out a press release. They just got married. You know, Lisa Marie and Michael Jackson are married. And we go, oh. We all turned around and walked back into the office because that was like we had to scrap the whole front of the whole front of the show is out because we had to be current. So when when Tona and everybody came in the next morning, we had to have Michael Jackson marrying Elvis, you know, you know, basically that, you know, or whatever that was was going to be the front end of the show. So then everything that you were planning for that morning had to get scrapped, get pushed. You know, I mean, that's the way it was all the time. So speaking of beat, I'm sorry, you're going to ask something. Go ahead. I do actually. Um... I want to ask about finding love. So, 
Andrew and I knew each other from uh, Bugs Life and then uh, from Toy Story 2, you know, and Monsters Inc. And we did some, so we got to be really good friends, uh, just to sort of to preface this. And I knew that he, when he's work, he's a guy who was working on one thing, he's writing the next thing. He writes in his spare time, you know, that's kind of crazy. But, um, but anyway, he was, I knew he had a thing, it was called something Nemo or something. I was working at Disney, I had a contract at Disney where uh, I was working on a lot of Disney, Disney or Pixar uh, projects. So I was down at uh, the Burbank Studios and uh, working here, and I knew that he was working, but he and I would talk to each other and email each other, but we would, I would never ask him about this next project. Because he says, don't, Dave, because one of the things that I was taught at late night and what I do is if you gave me one idea, I, because of what we had to do at late night, I had to give you every option for it. Okay, what if it was this? What if it was that? What if it was that? And you know, that's good, but if you're in the mode of just trying to lay out the story, you don't want to, he said, I'd never get off of page one if I was working with him. So he says, let me write this thing. Let me get the skeleton out and I'll get it. So he wrote on and off for a year. I didn't even know till a month before I got on the show that it was about fish. I mean, seriously, oh I didn't even know it was about fish. I just said, uh, something's called Nemo and I don't know. And I said, what is this? And everybody at Disney, it was kind of like, it was sort of like the secret, don't tell Dave what Andrew's doing. <laughs> so then I go, so what is this thing? Well, you can tell me, I'm a friend. He goes, no, Dave, sorry, don't know. I go, you're in development, you know what he's doing. And they go, no, sorry. So it was like this, they kept it from me. Because they know if I knew any kind of little piece of it, I'd be sending him seeing ideas or whatever. So he gets, he gets the script together. And um, he calls me, and, and the way this timed out was really funny because I had left Disney for a, a bit to go up to, uh, to go over to Universal to try to develop Where the Wild Things Are for Marie Sendek and Tom Hanks' company. And um, I was working on that for like a year or so. And so I get a phone call, and one day, and it's, and it's Andrew. He says, uh, hey, do you have any time to work on Nemo? I said, oh, you're going to tell me what it's about now? And he said, yeah, yeah, I, I'll tell you what it's about. You want to, do you have any time? And I said, I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm probably free tomorrow, right? You know, because I think they were going to fire me on where the wild things are. <laughs> so he says, well, if they don't fire you, so I said, yeah, I'll still come up. So he flies me up. I come in. And he had written a script. He had a whole script out, long, but big fat draft. He had been kind of working on and off for about a year while he was finishing up, I don't know, what it, whatever is the movie before. Anyway, probably Monsters, Inc., probably Monsters, Inc., but anyway. So um, anyway, I come in, and uh, he says, okay, well, here's the thing. Uh, we just sort of uh, have been talking to Albert Brooks to play the father, and it's been written, the, you know, the script has been written for a different actor who had been sort of doing test voices for, for a year, and then they said, but we might get Albert. I said, okay, and, they, and, he, and he said, we have Ellen, and, you know, and he played me a tape of Ellen just being Dory, and I was like, you know, you're dying laughing, all right? So, so it was like, okay. And he, you know, he told me how he saw her do a stand-up, just as a side. He, Andrew saw uh, Ellen. He, originally, Dory was supposed to be a, a boy, uh, a male character. He saw Ellen do the stand-up, and he goes, that's Dory. And he, then he just flipped the whole thing around in his head. He goes, that's how it's going to be. And so uh, then he wrote this all out, pretty much the same structure you know now. There was a lot of flashbacks in it. And it but he was just laying out as you do uh, the story just for characters. So flashbacks would really inform how the characters were feeling at that time. So, so he had that down and it was, a, you know, it's a great script, he's a fantastic writer. And, um, but it lacked a little, some humor and some character stuff and then the tank gang wasn't, wasn't fleshed out at all. So it was like he would literally have spots in here, tank gang, see, you know, where, where, where Nemo was being held because he was really working on the Marlin, Dory, Marlin's, what he's going through sort of thing. So um, he then plays me, because Albert Brooks was up at Pixar the day before, said Albert walked around and um, he decided to go into the recording booth and ad lib what he thought a fish would sound like. And so you gotta imagine what that is like. You know, I mean, it's just Albert Brooks. But first of all, Albert heard Ellen. And he said, well, you don't need me. That's the funniest thing you're ever going to have in your movie. You don't need me. You need somebody who can play a straight man to her. And Andrew had, who Andrew is a fantastic salesman. He just said, "I know this is you," because Albert had little boys at the time, 
He says, you got, this is you. This, is, this can be you easily. And he sold them. And he said, you will be funny. And it will be funny. You know, but you're going to tell the story that we kind of all know. So the end of this meeting, we're talking about it. And we're talking about a lot of ideas like what he could be like. And one of the things that we kind of clicked on in this meeting, that, you know, you got to remember, I was, the other day I was in a meeting where they're going to fire me because they don't know what they're doing. And um, I'm here, and Andrew hands me this script, like this big. It's the working draft. And he goes, here's the thing. If we do get Albert, you know, if he says yes to the next couple days, we're going to have him in a recording session a week from today. Could you rewrite everything for him like, like, like this? And he, because he, we've worked so long together, I go, sure, OK. You know, I'm like, all right, you know. So when I was on the plane going back here on Southwest Airlines, I'm in with a pen just going through, you know, just taking notes. And I just started, like, got home, just started writing. It's like the late night day. Just started writing and writing, generating pages, because now we're forming a different Marlin than the Marlin that was there before. Still the same nervous Marlin, but a different with an Albert spin and trying to get his voice and how he would be nervous differently than another actor. But one of the things that in that first meeting that we came, that we kind of clicked on was, and I said it to Andrew and he really jumped on it was, I said, because it was all about Ann, uh, Albert wondering if he's going to be funny. And here we go, he's the funniest guy in literally walking the planet. He's going to be funny. <clears throat> but I just, at one point I just realized, I said, he can't be funny, right? The stuff he did on his little tape, you know, making fun of sea urchins or whatever the heck it was, you can't do that. He can't do that because the minute we run into him and when he is in the movie, he's looking for his son. So you can't stop and be funny when you're looking for your son. That was the key that happened like with the first sort of meeting Andrew and I had is like he says, he's driven. He has to go. You can't, you can't any, you know, you can't eat. You can't sleep. You can't do anything. Your son has been taken. So you have to, so that we were talking earlier about, you know, these movies that you're doing if they're animated, you know, they're fish or they're llamas or they're whatever, toys or whatever the heck they are, but they're people. You got to say, oh, that's like my, my uncle. Oh, that's like my brother and I used to do this. And that's the way audience relate to this. So here's a guy who, his son was snatched in front of him. How horrific is that? I mean, and he's got to find him. And so then you say, he's in the, he could be anywhere in the world. You'll never find him. But I got to go. I got to go find him. So <clears throat> if you're doing that, he doesn't have any time to, to sidestep and make fun of this or make fun of this. So we had to sort of rejigger the way Albert was funny was, I said, he can only be funny when he's not moving, when he's trapped in a submarine, when he's you know, in a whale, or when, you know, when, when he's not moving, or when he's sort of reacting to something that Dory's done, right? You know, he's, 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 then he has to be the audience for us in the shot. Does that make sense? Like when he, I was this thing, this little riff, <coughs> he goes, <coughs> excuse me, I can't believe I'm like half a million miles away from home or whatever it is. And I, you know, my son is lost. I was like, and I'm with somebody who can't remember where they are. You know, that, that yeah, he goes, and then she goes, yeah, that must be rough. You know, like that. Like, you know, he has to be your audience, right? He, we're going to, you know, because now he's the straight man to the whole crazy world around him. But he has a goal that he has to, he can't let up on. Right? So that's what you're doing. You're, you know, there was a, there was a thing that Disney did uh, when it came out that they noticed that um, the reaction from boys, <clears throat> 12 to 14, they, you know, Disney researches everything. Um, girls loved it. Girls that age loved it. Boys loved it too, but boys were afraid if you asked them while they're watching the movie what was going on, they said there's no way. Because they, the boys put it together sort of like concretely. That, that fish is not in the ocean, it's in a tank in a room. If he was in the ocean, you might have a shot, right? right. So a boy will think literally, like logically, like, no, it's not in this pool, right? Girls will go, the heroic thing, like, he'll find a way. He'll figure it out. Boys are like, you're done, <laughs> right? You're done, move on, like that. <clears throat> so it was a really funny thing because Andrew was so smart when he did this thing. Now, and he'll tell you, you know, uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons, I mean, he, he, this is his whole story. I mean, I was just very fortunate that he 
wanted to work with me and, and Bob Peterson, who's you know uh, another Pixar guy who's fantastic. He's really getting a shot now. He's got he's got the uh, the, the dinosaur movie coming up, but he also co-wrote and co-directed uh, Up, and he's the voice he's he's the voice of Roz. He's the voice of Doug Doug the dog, and you know he's fantastic. Yeah, he's Bob Peterson's one of the. He's, so we were really lucky. It was Andrew, Bob, and myself. So I kind of got, you know, to work with some really great guys, and Bob and I were able to help figure out the Tank Gang, while Andrew was doing all. You know, there's a lot of moving parts to getting that that movie going. So he let us like run and riff on Gil, and you know, Gil was Gil was sort of like the Marlin of the Tank. You know, he's the leader and all that stuff. So you had. A, so, but all this deb and flow, you know, all that sort of stuff. I mean, we had so many scenes where deb and flow were arguing with each other. And, you know, Bob had this thing where they were singing a duet. So you'd only hear like the second half of it. You know, the, the fish that sees a reflection. You say, potato, potato, <laughs> let's call the whole thing. I mean, it was just hilarious. You know, he had a lot of that going on. That's and then he, and then he was, in, then she was in love with gurgle and stuff and like and you know and she's like you don't want to go out with me because you're in love with my sister aren't you and it was just crazy you know so we're doing all that stuff and then you would have bloat and you'd have all the people that you have so we were trying to corral that but in that the tank has the tank has a three-act arc right you come in you figure out and then we there was a lot of like there's a lot of scenarios in that one about how Nemo helps them because they wanted to do the thing where Nemo you know, uh, comes up and, you know, yeah. right, right? But the thing is, we were, all these different things, they pull off the top of it, and I said, what if it's dumb luck, okay? Now, there's no, that he doesn't have a skill, right? What if he's just the right size? What? He's just the one, the first guy who's small enough to fit through there. So then all of a sudden, Gil's like, this is my, this is my way out. So you have to think when you're writing the script, you have to think like people like, Jesus, I want to really get out of here. Hey, this guy could fit in the tube. Oh my God. But he's not, he doesn't want to break out, but he's got to do it. We got to make him want to break out. You know what I mean? So you want to, so you want to see your dad, don't you? You want, I mean, it wasn't like he was, it, they were working at cross purposes. He was trying to get out. Gil wanted out. This kid wanted to go see his dad. So, hey, let's feed into this. I mean, it would all kind of work that way. But every one of those beats, and the Pixar guys are like this. And, you know, and I, my late night stuff was write, write, you know, you would write a list of, of, of lines and, Conan or Robert Smigel would come up and go, I like number two. So then you'd write 10 versions of number two. And then he'd go, I like number one and one for six. Then you write 10 versions of one, 10 versions of six. Now this was not like, they were just trying to get the right lines or the right jokes or the right premises. So when I came to Pixar, I was felt right in place. Because you sat there and said, what? so that's why, so Andrew, Andrew does this thing where he doesn't call me because he doesn't want to be riffed to death, right? So he's, I said, uh, I said, so, we sat there and tried to figure out different ways to, you know, get Nemo involved. Is is he is he a willing accomplice? Does he want to break out? So, you know, and so, and then I, and then he fit in the tube. So now 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 we're going to go. So now, then you have all the you have all the permutations of uh, of the jailbreak. How crazy that sounds, right? And and then you know we can, and the, what the Pixar guys do the best is right when you think okay well, we figured out the system, they put in the aqua scum. Right, they put in the, the, while they were all sleeping, he puts in the filter that cleans the tank. So their whole beautiful plan to escape was screwed, right? Right, right when you think that they figured it out, they'll close the door on you, right? Remember in Toy Story 2 when they're on the plane and, 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 and Woody lifts open the thing and gets Jesse out of that case and they goes, come on, you know, we gotta go to a room and he comes out and he pulls the thing and they go, this is great and slam, the door slams. Like you really go, oh my God, they're done. Oh, they're not. Now we have to do a rescue from the plane ra racing down the runway. So they top themselves all the time. And they have to try, you just try to be smarter than the, the, the beat before you. you, you go ahead. I'm sorry, you no, told no. a great story about that in, in Toy Story about um, the orange cone scene. Right, Toy Story 2, when, I, when it was first up, um, I was working here and there and they asked me to come in and I rewrote a bunch of stuff for Woody and Buzz, and that was the premise when it first came to me, Toy Story 2, when it was straight to video. That was when, you know, that first, the first pitch of it was straight to video, then once they saw it, they go, oh, right, we're gonna bump it up, right? But um, 
was that Woody was old. You know, Woody was old. And so I, would, I was coming in to rewrite a bunch of Woody stuff and a bunch of Buzz Woody things. And they showed a screening. And they showed the screening, and the screening was pretty rough, and, but there was some animated stuff there. And you saw the whole movie, and the movie was good and was engaging and all this stuff. And at the end, of, towards the end, there was the finished scene of the orange cones when they tried to go across the street. Remember that? They had to sneak across the street in the orange cones. And that was hilarious. In the screening we saw, I mean, there were some really good bits along the way, but that was hilarious. And I come up to Andrew at the end of the screening, and he says, all right, what'd you think? You hadn't seen it, what'd you think? And I said, love it, it's great. You know, some things need work. And he says, um, but he says, uh, what, but what's wrong with it? I said, well, no, it's all good. But you know what's really good is that cone, the orange cone scene. That is, that's killer. That is perfect. I said, it's what you, when you guys get it right. And he said, yeah, that's the problem. The whole movie's gotta be like the orange cone scene. And I, and I said, what does that mean? He goes, yeah, I think we, we gotta go back to the board. And when he said that, I went, well, but what part? And he goes, I don't know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be brutal. Because they had gotten to a point very late in the game when they were animating a lot of the stuff and it was really good. Let me tell you, if you guys would have seen that first pass, you're going, I love it. But it wasn't good enough for them. It wasn't good, like that opening scene, like Andrew came up with this idea for that opening scene where it was a video game. You know, it was like that sort of a Star Wars thing. You're on, a, you're on a planet and things are, I mean, that came out of a bunch of guys uh, just brainstorming on how to make the opening bigger. Right, Let, let's you know, because the first Toy Story, you know, was was very simple, and now we're at a level where people expect more. So then they said, let's go into let's go into Rex's mind. You know, so they took the characters, and they keep the char characters consistent. And I think if you go back and you look, uh, you know, if you have ten hours or whatever it is, or <laughs> say eight hours, you run them run them back to back. You nobody changes. That's the beauty of what they do. Because you notice, like, and we see enough sequels of, of movies. Sequels, to me, see, always seem to be longer scenes and more close-ups, right? When you see a sequel of a movie, you go, oh, I loved it. It comes, name a sequel, except for Godfather 2. Uh, was, that, was that a better one? The second one? Yeah, the second one was better than the first. Well, yeah, because he was figuring out how to do it. Yeah. So the second was actually the first one. And all the rest of them, right, right, so, so, you know what I'm talking about. So that the, that that second one was really his first, it was. because the first one was like, geez, they're letting us do this. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, and like, and oh, oh, and it clicks, right? That was sort of like a draft. Right. Okay. I mean, who am I? <laughs> yeah. And you tell James Cameron I said so. <laughs> um, but anyway, the the Pixar guys, you know, they 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 all say that their names are on it, right? So th that's the whole thing with that. And so they won't let it out. We always joke, we won't let it out of the room because we don't want our family or our friends to go, hey, kind of sloughing off there a little bit. And Toy Story is, is the pinnacle. That's the bar. And so I came in right before Toy Story 1 was going to be uh, let out. And then so I worked on 2. And then so the 2 was that big rip down. You've all heard about that, right? Well, there was a right. All right. So the movie is going to be released in November. In about December, January, they decide we got to scrap a bunch of it. Now, this is December, January before is when you should be finalizing your movie. And they decided to, I think 70% of the movie they threw out and redid and reanimated and rescored and read everything. So what came out was beautiful. But what was happening was is that guys were just coming off of A Bug's Life, which was a really technically hard movie, and then they're going, you don't get your three months off, you gotta go right into Toys. But Pixar, it was a family, it is a family, and so they were all for this, and they said, this has gotta be as good, if not better, and they, and then the first one. Because people will look at, if they saw Toy Story 2 and it looked like, uh, the kind of the, the B-team knockoff, that ruins their credibility, right? And that's what they hold very important. So. When I was down here, I did this thing where I came up, they broke up the movie, that they were redoing into segments, and I mean, it really was an all-star team of, everybody would have a story room, like Bob Peterson had a story room, Andrew Sand had Pete Doctor, they all had story rooms, and they all had big, fat sequences. And I was this guy, because I knew the story, but I wasn't in the day-to-day -day of it, because I was down here. They flew me up, and I walked in a room, 
and Bob Peterson would say, all right, this is the, the, the toy repair guy. And then they, he just pitched me his whole thing. And I had one hour. Talk about your pitch fest things, right? I come and I go, hey, what if he did this? What if he did this? What if he did this? What if, what if, what if, like you said, we just riff for like an hour. And then somebody knocked on the door. Dave, all right, come on. Come out of the hallway. And I walk in the next one. Pete Doctor go, all right, Dave, this is my sequence. And we just, and I was, I was not the only one to do it. But they were in such a mode that we had a change in two-thirds of a movie in six months. And animate it and make it better. So that's how, that's how when that came out, that it, you know, uh, but it, it, it's their, getting back to the whole Nemo thing, it was, it was their commitment to the story and the commitment to doing it right. So that when I came on, I was on for a year. I was on for like the last year of the writing and the, the rewriting and the recording and the recording of, you know, Albert and Ellen and stuff. I mean, and some of it, you, you write all this stuff, you, you write all these things and you, you really work hard on it. And then you get into a recording room and then you hear Albert Brooks or Alan DeGeneres say your lines and you go, oh, wait a second, that sounds different. And so I remember, I remember coming into this uh, recording session with Albert Brooks and we were about to do a line uh, and we had to change tape so it was a break and I saw a line coming up that I hadn't written, somebody else had written, but I had a pitch for it. And so I just came up to him and I had just, I, I came up to him and I said, hey, you know this line here? I was thinking, what if you said this? And I just pitched the line, right? And he goes, and he looks at me, he goes, hey, now that's really, really funny. And he takes out his pen and he says, that is funny. And you know, you go, oh, well, you know, I just thought, I mean, you try to tell why you thought of the line, but inside you're like, oh, high five, all right, all right. You know, like, and you go, my, my, my writer's guild card has been stamped for life. Because, but you can't, I got like four more hours working with this guy, I go, oh, you know, so thanks, you know. And you're trying to shop, well, whatever. But I'll tell you one story. When we were doing with Albert, this will talk about your writing and you know your character, right? And, but you get to situations where you're gonna film it, you're gonna record it, you're gonna do whatever you're gonna do, and things change. But because of the background, we were talking before about how you know your characters and what your characters might say or do or whatever, even if they don't, even if they don't ever do it in the movie, you know where, not where they grew up, but what kind of person it is. Then you couple that with who's doing it, and you kind of know what they're all about. So you're kind of always kind of moving that ball around to make sure that they say the, the words the right way. Because you could write it, and you go, when he hear it, you go, oh, you know what, could you just flip the beginning and the end and do the front, you know, you just, to make, to make it work better. So we were gonna, we were recording the scene where uh, Marlon takes Nemo to school. Okay, so Marlon takes Nemo to school, and some of the, uh, these fish around there go, hey, you're a clownfish, you're funny, right? And he goes, oh, actually, that's sort of a misnomer. We're all, you know, like, we're all no funnier than anybody else or whatever it is, right? Come on, clowny, tell us a joke. And, you know, so, so th that's the setup. Now, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at the script, and I had seen it because I was working on something, and, and Andrew had written that really bad joke, right? You know, the CN urchin says to the CN enemy, whatever, whatever it is, like that, walks up to it, you know, one of those things. And I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it, and, now, and you know, Albert's like right there. Because when, all right, there's the other thing. When you're working with him, the minute he walks through the door, turn on the, turn on the recording. Just start recording everything. Because you never know what he's gonna, he's so fast. So anyway, he's standing right there, and I'm reading the joke, and I just started laughing, and I go, hey, what if he deconstructs a joke? And if you know anything about telling jokes, deconstructing a joke is telling the joke while you're telling the joke, and telling why the joke is funny. So, which makes it incredibly not funny. <laughs> so he looks at me, and he goes, I know, oh, all right. Like, now, I said it sort of fast, and Andrew goes, what are you talking about, Deacon, what? Like, and and, and I, another one of those, the, where Albert Brooks goes, I know what Dave means. <laughs> So he still remembers my name. So anyway, so he gets, he jumps behind the mic and he goes off and he goes, okay. So I do know a joke and he says, uh, a sea enemy walks up to a sea urchin. Well, he doesn't walk. All right, so no one's walking. All right, they're all talking and they're all talking. And he begins to pull apart the joke because, you know, who's funnier than him pulling apart the joke? Five minutes? Six minutes? The joke, and, we're, and, we're, and uh, Andrew's face is so beat red. We're holding our, we're literally. So now when these comedians are, are doing lines, they want to get funny. They want to get laughs, right? So when you're in a recording booth, you can't, you can't laugh. Nobody can breathe, you know, because you need the line clean. So we are, 
like this. And, and his face, I remember Andrew just literally was falling over. And he's like, like this, like this. He's doing this thing, excuse me, he's doing this thing. Now you look up at Alfred Brooks and his eyes are open, like, I'm gonna keep you. I'm gonna, he's like, I've got you, I got you down. I'm gonna not, and he goes, it was told to me by it was told to me by a sailor, but it wasn't a sailor actually. It was more of a merchant marine, but it wasn't. That has nothing to do with the joke. What I'm saying to you is, it's a sea anemone, and he is on and on and on, and finally he just steps away, and we all go, oh my god, like this, and we're laughing, we're clapping, and he's laughing because he knows how fun it was, and he's laughing, and I go, oh my god, that was so funny. We're all laughing, it was so funny. And I said, oh, I love that part about the, uh, the fisherman. That was just really funny. He goes, you like that? Jumps in front of the mic. Let me tell you a joke. Okay. And he goes into another five minutes of the joke. I mean, he just goes, do you like that part? And he, t but no, he tells a completely different bad joke and he pulls it apart. And he pulls it apart. So, all right. So this is what happens. This is writing in animation and writing in general. When you come up with some piece that all of a sudden, out of the bolt out of the blue, becomes great. Then you, it's like a wire. You go, it comes in here. Okay, that affects everything from here or everything before it. You figure, because it's all a big, like, clothesline, and you're just trying to f make it all fit, right? So we say, okay, stop, enough, enough. You know, he's, I said, we have 10 minutes. We need 30 seconds. And we have 10 minutes of him that we have to edit, right? But it was all great. We knew, but Andrew, Bob look at each other, and we all look at each other, and Andrew goes, that's a runner. I go, yeah, that's a runner. And so we then, since we all know the script, we go, where are the other two parts that that's going to come in, where he's either going to be asked to tell a joke or he tries to tell a joke. So, we, so then Andrew goes, oh. Yeah. And he looks at me and goes, Dave, sorry. He says 12-step. So the only little shorthand is the, the sharks, you know, fish are friends, right? The day, or earlier that day, I had written a speech for Marlon where he tries to back out of the, the thing, right? And he nailed it. And it was like, oh gosh. But he nailed it and it was, uh, he says something like, uh, I can see by your dead lifeless eyes and your rows of razor, razor sharp replaceable teeth that a lot of good is being done here. But I must, you know, and he's doing one of those sort of backing out is like, I know, and this is, we should all get together. I'll try to get it together. We'll all meet here in a year. It was one of those kind of ideas, right? And he did it as he was backing up. Then he backs into the, so so then then we're gonna then he has to see the uh, the mask. So then the minute we said that's a runner, because you're always long in these type of movies when you have really good comedic actors, we go that's going to be a runner right there. We'll tag it at the end, you know, and he does tag it at the end. But we knew that we we're taking out this much of dialogue for this much, right? And really going to save us some time. And then. We literally stop it where he goes, he sees, the, he sees the mask, right? But it was a great payoff. You know, I do know, you know a joke. You know, you know, so we, tell us a joke, became a thing that helped us. It helped us tie him together. And it was all, it was, you know, and it was not like I'm a genius about it. I just thought, oh, it wouldn't be funny if he couldn't tell a joke. But then you get him to give the performance. The performance was so great. You go, all right, we have to use that. And then so then we just sprinkled that in and but then you're 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 making an edit. None of that was in there. None of you know if, if the story had gone the other way where he tells the bad joke, like if he tells the bad joke like they do where where the uh, the other fish you know at the at the school are basically going uh huh, wow you know, like that like I mean that works that works right, but it really works better when he can't tell the joke right, and you know if he just told the joke and it was a bad punchline you're going oh, okay, and then we do the scene, but. This was better for, for the characters. But it's all based on who, that, who he was, Albert, what would be funny for the situation, what, would be, what, what have we all done when you, know, you go, hey, hey, guys, I got something I got to tell you. And you go, and they go, seriously, that was it? That was it? That was it? We waited for that? You know, or whatever, uh, that kind of idea. So you use all these things, and we were talking before about this, is because they're fish, they're, not, they're, they're people. That, you know, and, and that's the way you have to write for them. Like for any, any movie. Like, you know, they happen to be fish in this case. So anyway, and then what else? I'm sorry, that was the longest answer. So actually, like, with film, like, say, yeah. there's a certain flavor, like, the topics Right? They're all, they're all, they're all, they're all, they're all right. Right. Is that come from, like, five guys that takes a look at that? 
Well, there's a collective up there. That's a pretty fun place. Uh, and they're very smart. And when I first started working for them, Andrew Stanton said, movies are our sports. They are the biggest movie watchers. You cannot have a movie that they have not seen. Because, and, and, I, and I say that to every, any, any writing panel I'm ever on, read as many scripts as you can, good or bad, see as many movies as you can, good or bad. I mean, unless they're really bad. I mean, they're really bad. Then you, you know, like Showgirls or something, you just watch it for fun, right? You know, and, and then, you know, I mean, you know, if they're really horrible, horrible. But you can always learn something, right? You can always learn something from anything you read, script-wise. And then the other thing is, like, if you like to write action stuff, get Shane Black scripts. Get, you know, get all those lethal weapon type scripts. See what they did, you know? Because how many different times can you write, you know, a car goes down a street like a roller coaster? Okay, just did that. Now what do we do? It bucks in like a Bronco. Okay. And, you know, I mean, you, you literally run out of descriptive words. So you have to figure out how to make these things work. Because the big sell for you is not like, oh, is your movie good? It's like, the, is the guy or girl at the studio, person at the studio, like it? Do I like to read this thing? Like, established people don't have to be as, you know, as hard on themselves. But none of us are established, right? Or, or I'm speaking for myself. But I mean, but, you know, you, you come in and, they, and you can go, I got to win you over with this script. Right? Story's got to grab me right off the bat. People got to grab me right off the bat. And if I'm reading a page of description to start the movie, dude, that better be a great page of description because the first paragraph, they're going to they're gonna look at it and go, what is this about? They'll, I mean, you'll have people, if, if like we open on a, you know, a planet, blah, 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 whatever the heck it is, they're going to see all of that, those words. I'm not kidding you. They're going to go, all right, maybe I'll just catch up to it, whatever. And then they'll go to the dialogue, right? So be brief, but figure out your words and make it count, right? And don't, you know, you know sometimes people write jokes or write, write little asides that are funny to their friends or something. They go, if it's, if it's, if it's not going to work for the show, like if you go, oh, I can only, Vince Vaughn is the only guy who can do this. Well, you better hope that you get it in his hands because you've just wasted 120 pages. You want to have a guy like Vince Vaughn or, but you want to get, have a guy that, you know, somebody else can play. You know, I mean, listen, the greatest thing would be they go, you know, uh, Channing Tatum wants to do it, and you wrote it for Vince Vaughn. Well, you, they'll rewrite it, okay? Be because at the essence, you're taking the core of your story, right? And the, 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 it, you know, unless the guy is like a, a slick guy who's he's a double talker, fast talker, you go, okay, there's like three guys can do that. Vince Vaughn is one of them. You know, and, he, and, you, and you go, okay, it, it depends on a guy like that. Like, you know, how, like the Music Man. You know, like one of those kind of like, or, you know, Paper Moon, if you know all those movies. Like, you need somebody who can pull the grift off, who can really be a double talker, right? You're not going to get Christopher Walken to be that guy, right? You know, he's got that cadence and, you know, and I've written, you're not going to get, you're not going to get him to make a really rat-a-tat sort of speech. So your story has to work. Your story has to work for whoever it is. And then, you know, another time, and I do this a lot, is like, go oh, flip it. Flip their story. You, you have a traditional story, and then if you go, what if the guy was a girl? Or what if the girl was a guy? You know, how would you write this differently, right? Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to make your story like um, bulletproof. You go, okay, you don't like the dialogue, you don't like the anything, but you gotta admit, that story's awesome, right? You go, well, yeah, it's a pretty great story. Because you'll read this a lot of times that uh, ideas get bought, you know? Ideas will get bought, but they'll, and they'll, I've been handed a script. Read the script, throw it away. Take the core idea and rewrite it. Swear to God, somebody's 120 pages, worked their head off on it. Guy tried to be funny, tried to be this, tried to be that, tried to make it fell in the weeds. Whatever they want to do, they go, we like the idea of the guy, the girl, this, and the bank robbery. That's it redo it. So it always comes down to this, because at the end of the day, anyone who's going to buy your stuff is going to buy your idea. Now, they may buy you, they go, you know what, you have crap ideas, but you really write good dialogue. We're going to give you an idea. Put your good dialogue on a good idea. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, hey, that's, that check cashes as well as the other ones, right? So I don't care. But if you're trying to get your foot in the door, you want to have the idea. And you, and you don't want it to be, listen, you want to get an idea out 
and we're talking about this before the the Brits that are here you know they do the the if you, anybody can get over there to, to the uh, London Screenwriter Festival is fantastic they do these I think you guys are going to have the, the, the pitch off tomorrow or whatever that is, and elevator pitch, and you got to try to tell somebody an idea really quickly. It's hard, super hard. You want to be able to tell somebody an idea really in 10, 15 minutes. If I, if I can pull you aside, go, you got 10 minutes, I can tell you an idea. And you want to tell their story out, and then they go, oh, that's cool, I'd like to hear that. That's a cool idea. You know, I mean, yeah, you want to whittle it down to everybody wants a one sentence or two sentences. It's, it's impossible. The, the, the easiest one I heard, and this will tell you the date of this one, it never got made, was Chris Farley goes to Butler School, right? I thought it was, I said, that's the, I'll see that movie, you know? I said, you know what it is. You don't have to know anything about the acts. You don't have anything to go, that guy goes to Butler School. That's it. I go, oh, and it's like a Merchant Ivory film. Yep, let's go, right? I mean, that's an idea that, if you have that kind of idea, or anyone who gets out of here with that idea, well, well, then go, Jack Black goes about their stuff. <laughs> you know, but anyway, but anyway, you know, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's a classic kind of Hollywood pitch. And everybody will have that kind of one-liner. And you and I will sit in our garages, that are converted into offices, and, uh, and, uh, and try to think of that one-liner, right? And if you, you know, and I've had other directors, uh, Mark Kindle, this director I worked with at Disney, he said, you know, one of the other things is, is that the title has to work for you, right? Finding Nemo is about Finding Nemo, right? And it's, you know, there's something about Mary. Weird title, but you go, yeah, well, there's something about, there is something about Mary, right? You know, like, you kind of get it. It's when these titles like, what the hell does that mean, right? And, and when, that gets stuck on when people don't know what the movie's about. You know, I'm not saying your title has to be your movie and vice versa, but it, sometimes it helps if you know what you're, what, because it's, it's reinforcing your idea. Because at the end of the day, you're going, what the hell are they finding Nemo? Oh, right, they're looking for Nemo. Like, you can literally keep kind of come going back to it, right? If, it, if, it's, if it's sort of driven by a, a plot device like that, you know? So, um, I don't even know if I answered your question. I, I, uh, I uh, here's the long story on that one. I was late for my panel, so they canceled it. Yeah, I know. So I have to fold up all these chairs at the end. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. No, I, I, my bad. Huh? Uh, I don't have a card, but these guys know. Bob knows how to get a hold of me. Bob, Bob runs the place. Bob Schultz. So if you find him, you'll, he'll, he'll find me. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I I'm sorry. He's supposed to be. I, I... Oh, okay. I can hang out if anybody wants it, you know, because I came late. <laughs> because I, I know, I know. I... It's okay. It's all right. Sure. Yes. If if the if the rules of the world aren't apparent in the in the premise, you know, Nemo, you know what it is, you know, um, Toy Story, toys come alive when the kids leave the room, you you you, thanks. But so, if it's important, yes, but be brief and be get it right. You go, if it's an alternate world, you know. It's the world of, you know, it's, the, it's, it's uh, the monsters that come out of your closet. This is the world. That's what's behind, that's what's under your bed at night. That's what's in the closet. Then, then you know, but just try to, try to get it, try to, if you can, bring your uh, example back to what I can understand. You know what I mean? Like it, it, you know, like if you try to, what is the Matrix about again? Oh, he dodges bullets in slow motion. I don't know. You know, the, he's asleep. Is he's kind of a, you have to kind of get those, you have to kind of get that uh, established in a way that is very gettable. You know, and every once in a while you go, and remember, in this world, everything's backwards. Oh, right, okay. You know, you got to keep kind of, because then if you tell a plot point, and they go, what? Oh, everything's backwards, right? So you have to, 
it's kind of keeping the math all in line, you know, so that you know what you're, so your listener knows what you're, you're pitching, right? It's just trying to be clear, try, you know, and I'm guilty of it, try not to get bogged down in details, sidetracks, that stuff will all come. You'll fill all that stuff out, right? Just get your story out. And, and, and why, here's the other thing that's really important is, is like, why do I care? What am I watching? Like, and you can you have to be like like a, a studio person who's going to put out a hundred million, twenty million, whatever. I don't care, a hundred dollars to make your movie, right? Why do I care? Right? Why do I care that Marlon? Well, it's his son. He can't find his son. Everybody knows that. All right, that's an easy one. I mean, in a way, but it's like, why do I? Why, why is my hero? Do, why am I rooting for my hero? Right? There's a lot of animated movies now, and I'm not going to name who they are, uh, and and they tend to go for jokes because they got the scenario, they got the world, and they go, you know, I'm going to do every joke and pun off of that. I can. Oh, and the guy should get to the end of the thing. What? So you're there going joke, 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 and it's all very surface. It's all very, very much like cotton candy, right? It's all very quick. And you go, you want to see that movie again? No. Why? Because I know all the jokes. Like you know, you rarely do you watch a, 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 a rewatch a, a comedian's stand up uh, for the jokes. You watch it for the person. You watch it because you're watching that person, right? Richard Pryor is like today. I just saw a, a thing that he did in '71. It's like you could see it today. It's like Louis C.K. You like Louis, you like his person. So he's telling you jokes, but you're following his story, right? And his story is that hour that he's with you. So this is the same thing with this. Is like, you, I don't care. And, and this is the other thing that we always work with at, at Pixar and is jokes come last. I keep talking about jokes, but jokes come last because, you know, jokes seem to be like, oh, hey, that's, you know, but jokes are easy, but they can get you off track. You know, you can really start riffing on stuff and be really funny and very clever. And, oh, it's, you know, that's sort of a play on words of this. And in the real world, it's this. And, and they go, uh-huh. But we're still wondering, why is that guy still here? You know, and why, and I have a problem with some things in Shrek that I won't get into, because you all seem very nice. But there was a sort of a problem with that story where he says, I'm getting into it, he says, I'm like an onion, there's layers to me, there's layers to me, right? And like, I go, okay, and it's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside, right? So why couldn't Shrek marry the pretty girl? because she's an ogre on the inside. And he's pretty, you know, you know what I mean? She had a, I had a sort of fundamental problem with like why she became an ogre. Because your whole story was telling me it's I'm beautiful on the inside, right? And she, you know, she loves the beautiful guy on the inside. Why did she have to turn ugly in order to, you know what I mean? You could be an ogre on the inside and don't have to look like an ogre. That was my, that was a story point for me Listen, they've done all right with the series, you know, you know, you know, four billion dollars or whatever. People seem to buy it, but that to me was a story point because all right, donkey's funny, everybody's funny, every, you know, every, all those things are funny and great, and they're sort of like window dressing. But you're following Shrek's story, his love story, right? You're following him, a guy who who starts the movie saying, "Get out! I don't want anyone in my life." When actually he does, he collects people along the way. So I go, I got all that, but that was a plot, that was a sort of a, a style choice. I said, well, that just doesn't, I, I just was bummed by that. I'm just thinking, and I can't speak for Pixar, but I think they wouldn't have done it that way, and other people wouldn't have done it that way, but, you know, they did it, they did it well, and they're all good, and I have friends over there, so. Um, but it was, it, it, it's being true to your story. You set up a thing where a guy can't do this, he can't do it. And if you all of a sudden go, hey, I got a magic powder that can make you do that. Well, that's kind of what we call a writer's convenience. Like, I, wa I wanted you to do this, and wouldn't it be fun? But wait, did have for 60 minutes we've been saying he can't do that. And so you go, then your audience, whether or not they'll say it like we will, because we're all writers, they'll go, that's bullshit, you can't do that. But the audience will go, oh. They'll just know that it's not true. And when it's true, at the end, it works. Right? It just it just does. So the guys up in Pixar watch movies like it's they're watching a movie. Because we always would go into a screening and we'd watch it and you'd be sitting there and you know, you see a rough screening, you know, and all of a sudden you hear somebody go, No, 
Nope. He's working on the movie. Nope. And then write it down. Not working for me. And you know, when you put these things together, you go, well, this seems like a, we're working on the sequence and this and that. It's going to all work out. But once you get it up there and you hear people say it, you go, nope. Don't believe him. Don't believe his life. You know? There was a, there, I'll tell you a little thing. When, when I was, I wrote the movie, The, uh, the Emperor's New Groove. So, we are in the room. Mark Dindle's in the, in, on the recording stage with him. I'm, I'm in the booth, and I have a two-way, I'm telling you all the secrets. I have a two-way connection between the director and myself. Because I would say, hey, have them say it this way. Have them say, you know, I was just like pitching other lines or whatever. Because it was just easier to do it this way with Mark. Um, and, and David's reading the thing. But David's got such a comedic sensibility to him that his heartfelt apology was funny. It wasn't heartfelt. And we go, yeah, Dave, you know, you're really sad about it. He goes, I'm doing sad. I'm doing sad. You know, and so he's like, mm, you know, like, you know. So he starts, kept doing it, right? And we go, okay. And he got it. And you get it. And I, we had a break, and I just turned to Mark. I go, it's not going to work. It's, I mean, I get it, and, and th seeing him do it, you, you know that he did it, but it, because now you're only hearing it in animation. You're only hearing it put up against a llama's face, right? And so um, we were stuck, because if you don't buy his apology, you don't buy the end of the movie. You go, That's, he faked it. You know, he didn't sound, he didn't sound sorry. And then all the rest of it is nothing. It's hollow. So we had to fix it. No, I, since it's been so long, none of you know how I fixed it. But I said, this is what we're going to do. I said, we're going to... He can't say it, because he can't say it. And so what I wrote, and this is fantastic writing, is a lot of this. Pacha, about what I, about what I said. I, uh, I, what I meant, uh, like that. I wrote a bunch of that, dot, 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 in between each one of them, right? So he reads it. The animator animated a very sorry face. I, what I meant to, uh, and then John Goodman goes, "Hey, you want you want to go? You done being a llama? Or whatever the line was." And he goes, "Yes, like this." Apology. That was the apology. He never said, "I'm sorry." He never said the words, "I'm sorry." Never said it. It was all the acting. So that was I had to write that. We had to write that. On, we had him in the room. We had to write it on the fly. But you're figuring out the movie as you do it. Because every time you come to these situations, you go, the speech is perfect. And <clears throat> Mark, the director, loved the speech. He goes, oh my god, he, he, he said that, everyone's going to be crying. You know, it's like, yeah. But he couldn't. And he couldn't get it. And it was not his fault. It was just not the right thing to do. So we, but you have to finish the movie, have to get it right. So we put it on him, took the words out of his mouth. He's so sorry, he can't even say the words. But the other, the flip is the John Goodman character understands, and he goes, "Okay, you know, uh, stop. Let's go," and that's it. So that's how that's a that's a workaround. That's a cheat that we needed. And Spade came up to me later and said, "A lot of people really compliment me on my scene there, my little dramatic scene at the end." I go, "What?" He goes, "You know, when I apologize to Goodman, everybody loves that." I go, "He's going to say," and he goes. I, he's going to say, well, thanks for what you did. And, I, and he goes, I told you I nailed that thing. I told you. I go, okay. So he thinks he said the speech that he read. He didn't say it, but he thinks he did. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, okay. Boy. He was not, he's not letting a kid be a kid, which was a, such a powerful idea that we all deal with when we're dealing with, when you're dealing with scripts, and especially animated scripts and family films is like, Think of your life today and, and how it, and I'll get back to that in one second, but the second part of this is, and just to tell you, he used to go, the, the B part of it is, he used to go to a dentist and they had a fish tank in there. And he said, oh, you know, and he is such a genius. He was like, as a kid going, I wonder what they're doing in there. He says, I bet you they're planning a breakout, like that kind of idea. So imagine having that idea when you're 10 and then you wait about 20 years and then all of a sudden you go, oh, I have a place for that idea, right? So don't throw away any idea. That's another thing. But the other thing is, so getting back to the sort of the the day to day of life, everybody tries to create avatars, you know. And, and I say that 
everybody wants to do that kind of movie. Now, I mean, you, you may not, you know, you may want to do a small film or something like that, but everybody wants to do a huge blockbuster, right? And the idea, you want to, you want to write what you know, but set it in the world you want to set it in. So if you want to set it in space, set it in space, but then write what you know. Because when you start writing outside of your, your comfort zone, it shows. You know, you, you, you go people like, well, he's all good on the action stuff, but when he got to the love scenes, oh my God, it was crazy. You know, well, he lived by himself, he's not alone, you know, whatever. So, <laughs> with his action figures. So he gets the action stuff, you know what I mean? You can have that, right? So, but you know, you write what you know, right? So, so that guy who can write an action movie is not gonna write a, ro a, a rom-com, he's not gonna write a romantic comedy, right? Unless it has a lot of action in it. So, um, that's one of the things. But, I'm doing a, 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 a movie, or I'm trying to do a movie for Steve Carell right now, and and the one thing that he struck on and I struck on was this idea of, of today's family, and I have two girls that are 13 and 11, and when you go to the table, everybody has hectic lives, and everybody has, you, know, you could put this in your own life, in your own world, wherever, think about it when you are here today, is how many people are on their iPhones, just in between, you tell me, ask me something, I go, oh, and I talk to you, and I go, uh huh, uh huh, uh -huh. okay, like, I'm with, and you're, nobody's connected, right? Unless there's no Wi Fi here. No one's connected because we're all on our phones, we're all, so Steve has this idea, and his company has this idea, and, and uh, one of the things is, is a family that's like that. We come into a family like this uh, that is, uh, they're practically texting over the dinner table, past the, past the peas. You still block me? You know, like you're blocking me. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work. You know, I'm sending a text to mom. Tell him to pass the peas. Like that. I mean, whatever it is, it's that kind of craziness where it's you're, you're so swallowed up by technology that like you go, I right, put the phones down and the iPads down. Okay, and now you get up and you walk over to your laptop. You know, and so there's so, so he has this element of, and I'm not gonna give the whole story, but the idea is is he wants to break his family from that. And how do you do that? You know, how do we, you know, you can't physically take them out of your hands, but then they have friends and stuff. You have to move them, you know, to Amish country. And, I, and I, I'm telling you, they will, they have Wi-Fi in Amish country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah those butter churns. So. Uh, you know, they're also cell towers, right? <laughs> like a huge 40-foot butter churn, right? Um, so, that, so anyway, yeah, so that was the idea. The, the, the Nemo thing was, it's a long, pro like every animated movie, it's four years. Andrew Stanton wrote the script, uh, the, 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 the template script that I got onto for over a year and a half. He just kept rewriting. He re he's sort of a machine that way, but it helps him think. And he rewrote it. And while I was doing things in, in, in down here at Disney, and then and when he was ready, when the script was a big fat script, but it had a nice arc to it. He called me in, then he called uh, Bob Peterson in, and then the two of us, the three of us kind of took, you know, then he was able to step off and start to develop the technology for it and the waves. Literally, you know, that's another part of the Pixar stuff is the, the animation is so state of the art. When I came up there, I went into a screening room and they showed me a picture of, um, of uh, like a coral reef and fish swimming in a coral reef that they shot when they were down in Australia. And then they put it up and then they put another one up right next to it. it was, so it's like a double image of the same thing, right? Two images of the same thing. And they go, tell us which one's the animated one. And we're like, what the hell are you talking about? One of those is computer animated? They go, yeah, can you tell which one it is? They go, no, you can't. It's like a mirror image. They're so, they can be so precise. Now, think about Finding Nemo. It's pretty precise, but it's not. So what they had to go in and dial back, sort of soften the edges. You know, you make eyes from the fish or whatever, that's fine. But they had to make the ocean look beautiful and real, but not too real. Because that is a static look that would take you out of it, right? So there's, you're, so you're thinking about all that stuff. So Andrew can tell you very long and involved stories about particle density, in water when sun is shining through it. And he, and he said, oh, you gotta love those meetings. And you gotta go, huh? we need a little more grit, a little less grit, a little more shaft of light. I mean, he was doing that. So Bob and I 
we're taking over, kind of rewriting dialogue and the story as we could and developing the tank gang. So it was sort of a, it's sort of a, a process, this two-step process. And then Andrew was in a, on it all the time and would check in on it with us. And then at the end, we started recording all the voices as we were kind of doing it. Right? Yeah, so, all right, so when you write for animation, so, I, so basically, what, all right, so this is the thing that's a little tricky when you read, if you don't know it, story in animation means storyboard artists, okay? And we're writers who go, hey, I wrote the story. Like, I came up with the idea. In live action, it means something like you came up with the idea. Story by so-and-so, you know, written by another person. Story in animation is storyboard art, right? So, they'll look, so I, if I write a scene, you give it to a storyboard artist. Then they take it and break it up, right? And, and board it out. Board out the big beats so that we see how this is going to play in animation. Now, storyboard artists will write, draw stuff, and they're geniuses. They'll draw stuff and they go, you know, this line didn't connect with that line, so I had to create a line or drop a line or change your line, you know, um, in order to make it work. But like when I was talking about before, you're thinking on the fly with like Albert Brooks, they go, wait, when I was drawing this thing, I thought, wouldn't it be funny if this happened? Or wouldn't it be dramatic if this guy? So then they rewrite your rewrite. They rewrite you, and then that's put up. So now, at the end of an animated movie, you'll see two things. Additional, uh, additional story is like other storyboard artists that they bring on to help out. Then there's additional screenplay. Like, they, I'm on a couple of those things like on Bugs Life or, or something, you know, as additional screenplay. Because I've come up and rewrite the screenplay, but I'm not the writer. Like, I have additional screenplay on Toy Story 3 because Michael Arndt was the writer. Okay, Michael Arndt wrote with the director. And I came up on Toy Story 3 because the way that it was laid out, they were doing it. Michael Arndt, who you know, he's a great writer, was working with on the, on the movie for like two years. And then there was a couple little scenes that weren't clicking. So Lee Unkridge, the director, called me up. And it was, so I rewrote um, Bonnie's toys, the new toys, right? Prickle pants and all that sort of stuff, you know. And, and, um, and so I wrote all that for Kristen Wiig and Jeff Garland and all that stuff. So I wrote that stuff, all their stuff. And then I rewrote a lot of the uh, Ken and Barbie stuff. You know, the I love you. Uh, now you say it, you know, the, you know, I mean, it was funny because you say, they said it's Michael Keaton and he's kind of like a male model. So he's sort of dumb. And, but she thinks he's the coolest guy in the world. But then he gets tricked by, you know, lots of, you know, so you get, so but that all factors in, right? You know, Ken being what Ken was, he thought he was doing the right thing for lots of. And then it's not until he sees, you know, I can't believe I'm explaining all this. And not until he sees what's really happening through Barbie's eyes and what's happening to Barbie because he loves her, that he realizes, oh my God, I'm frightened for the wrong side, right? Yeah. So, but that all works into character because you have to make Ken a guy who's not smart enough to know that from the beginning. He's just a male model who thinks that his boss is, you know, he left live in the dream house and he's got all the clothes and all that sort of stuff. So you kind of kind of go with that. So then you know that Mike, then you go, Michael Keaton's going to play this guy. So then Michael Keaton knows comedy. He knows how to play the jokes. So you are just laying all that in. That all becomes part of it. Now, when we're writing at home, we got to kind of do all that on our own. You got to go, I hope this guy is like this. And you got to make that consistent. Because I'm going to read it, unless you describe your, this is going back to your script, unless you describe your script as, I, I'm reading it, I go, that's Vince Vaughn, or that's The Rock, or that's whoever. And, or somebody just like, that's how you're going to read it. If you say six foot three, built like a you know, bodybuilder, you know, like they go, all right, it's The Rock. I mean, who else is going to play that? I mean, if that's who the guy has to be. Like the Jack, that's the whole thing with Jack Reacher. You know the Jack Reacher thing? He was supposed to be The Rock. The Rock, I mean, I don't know about playing him, but that's who should have played him. The Rock, because Jack Reacher is six four and punches people and kills them with one punch. <laughs> Tom Cruise is great, but he's 5'9 and, you know, 160 pounds, right? So, you, you know, but when you're reading Jack Reacher, and you, you go, I'm reading The Rock. That's The Rock. That's the only guy who can play it, unless there's some other guy like him. 
who can suddenly act, right? So you're because so you have to know the way you describe your character in the beginning is I I'm going to tag an actor to it, okay? You have a main character. He's like this. He's like this. He's and you know. And, and he's forgetful, of that, you know, and they go, well, he's kind of like Dory. Well, maybe it's Ellen. Well, maybe if the woman is Ellen, you know, I, then I'm kind of reading it like Dory, Ellen, because that's a persona that I know. So you have to be really specific about who you, who your characters are at the beginning, because that's going to follow you through. And then you're going to do a thing like on page 120, you go, what? That guy wouldn't do that, because I'm going to hold it through that that's Vince Vaughn all the way through. And they go, now it's, you know, somebody else. You go, that doesn't hold true. So you got to you set up and then stay consistent, I guess. Yes, sir. It's all right. Why don't you come here? It just would be easier. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the thing. Just keep it consistent. Yes, sir. Okay, so he asked me if the directors or come to me or the writers when they're designing the character. Now, sometimes, most of the time, no. Most of the time, it's the other way around. They go, this is what Gil is going to look like. But, again, who the voice is um, determines how they're going to look. Now, they videotape, they, in animation, they always videotape the actor when they're recording because they do inflections, they do body movements, even if they're fish or toys or whatever the heck it is. Now, if you look at, and I always remember it, if you look at the first Toy Story, when they're at Pizza Planet, I think, or the gas station, or where they're, they're under a truck, and Tom Hanks says, you are a toy to Buzz. You go, that's Tom, that's Tom Hanks. Because the way he just goes, oh, you are a toy, like that. You go, I see Tom Hanks doing that, right? And so, with Ellen, they filmed Ellen, but then they did things with her mouth that's like the real Ellen. Like, and then the animators kind of did like little, and there's all these gears and stuff that they have to, you know, like 250 different gears to make a smile and all that in the computer, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, I, I'm the guy who goes, just make it kind of look like it's supposed to. And then you walk away. <laughs> and the guy, and, and, you know, he goes into a little hole and he spits at me. Um, but anyway, yeah, they, they will come to you every once in a while. And now, every studio, every director, every, you know, every head of studio, all those people are all different. Um, Pixar is very generous in taking uh, suggestions. And you could say, if you saw a thing, oh, I Gil, I said, oh, I actually saw him like, and you could say something like, this was already, like, I said, I thought he would have scars on his face. Like, if you said that, I go, why? Well, like, some failed attempts. And that's what they came up with. Failed attempts. And I actually had written some dialogue for that. But uh, he's like, yeah, you know, I made a break for it, you know, and it landed on some, on, on, a, on a filter. You know, and, and that's how he got these scars. You know, so he has these war wounds. So you can do that. Um, but mostly, they'll come to you and... And they'll say, okay, Wallace Shawn is this Wallace Shawn is is this T Rex, right? And then they then they go and then they figure out, oh, how his little hands would go. And oh, he's just so sad. Like this. And so they kind of well, Toy Story is because there's they're set toys. They're toys you know. They're toys so you're kind of putting the the fish on the other hand, you know, gurgle or bloat, you know, bloat was, you know, he's he's a puffer fish, right? But then you go, oh, but it's uh, Brad Garrett. And you go, oh, he'd be sort of like one with like sort of bushy eyebrows if he had eyebrows, you know. So they kind of get that thing, and then you're able to then you're able to do the joke. What we just did when we had Brad in the room was that he gets. I came up with this idea. That he gets so mad that he, he like he blows his like, poof. Oh, there you go. There you go. Oh, you know. And now he's like a balloon. He just can't. Oh, there we go. Oh, all right. No, little help. You know, like one of those things. Like he can't. Like he gets so worked up that all of a sudden it's just like, boop, because like, you know, he just goes, oh, I, and there I go. So, so you imagine pages and pages of that, you know, and then they take one little bit, you know. So that's what you have. If you've worked on animation, get ready to rewrite. And that's the biggest thing about writing anyway. I mean, that is, you just 
rewrite. And the, and, the, and the thing that kills writers and the key, that kills writers' chances of succeeding in this business is being married to your work. Now, you're going to know what your story is. You're going to know the way you like it and everything. And somebody comes to go, hey, what if the, you know, the guy instead of a 12-year-old was a 40-year-old alcoholic ex-cow? You just sit there and go, um, well, no. Or you go, yeah, well, maybe I can make that work. And then you have to see why. You know, a lot of people will just go because they want it different or they saw a movie with something similar to yours in it, right? I mean, you can't imagine how many times you go in a meeting and you say, well, you can't do this. Why? Because uh, there was a thing with uh, the same kind of cough in a movie I saw last year. I go, so? They go, but they're, when they're paying you, you go, all right. You, then you go, you make your case, and then you go, I'll change it. And then you try to change it. But you have to um, rewrite everything. Everything, every, your first draft is just that, your first draft. Now, Judd, uh, Judd Apatow likes to do a thing, and he does a thing that he calls a vomit draft. You just write everything. You, and it's 155 pages, and it's all over the place. And you're writing things, you're going, never going to be in this movie. Never going to be in this movie. Like, in this movie. Oh, that's a good line. Never going to be in this movie. Like, like, but, but you're getting from here to here, right? And you, and a vomit draft. He just throws it up. Yeah, it's bum. Um, but anyway, and, and he says, plus it's not very good, you know. So, so anyway, but it gets the idea out because the hardest thing, and everybody does, you get a third of the way through, halfway through, and you put it in a pile. You go, you know, because you're afraid to end. You're afraid to end it. Now, we all do it. I've got a stack. You know, I got a bunch of ideas that are really good, but they're not there because you. In committing to the idea, you've got to finish it. And you've got to finish it. And what if it doesn't come out as cool as the idea that's in my head, right? So that's why you turn off all your sensors, all your editing, and just write it. And then the other thing I say to everybody, because I've done it, you're going from here, this scene, you're going to the next scene, and you go, I don't know what that is. But you know what the scene is after that? You know that one. You write a log line. I always put it caps, all caps, bold. Tom tells Mary the bad news about work. TBD, whatever. You're going to figure it out. And then you go write what you can write. Write all the stuff that you have ideas for. Because people get stuck on that scene you can't write, so that's why you put it aside. Because you get stuck. So you got to work around it. You just go, I, I'm going to get it. So you put in slug lines or a note to yourself that you will remember. Or you know what, what has to happen. Don't know or like stuck and you go a plus b plus c have to happen here because i'm writing the next thing which i know is the outcome of this so if you do that and you jump to the next thing when you start writing the next thing you go oh i know what that scene is because you're working you're working past it right so you're working past it or you go you know what i don't even need that scene cut that scene just hook that scene up or you know so the big killer in momentum is overthinking an idea that you don't have fully formed. Don't let it stop you. That is the killer. That is why you'll, you know, we'll have so many unfinished, like, well, what are we having that really cool idea that you have? Yeah, you know, I just said we're gonna get out of act two. So, you know, it just bogged down. I go, why? Because other, and, and you'll pitch it to other people and they go, I know exactly, I see your movie when you pitch it. Yeah, but, and then there's the part of like, again, as I said, you don't want to, you don't want to ruin a great idea that everybody kind of knows. Who cares? If it's sitting on your shelf, no one's ever going to see it. So I'm writing a movie, uh, or I've been writing a movie, on and off for six years. And it's, a, it's an idea that I have uh, that I love and that people love, and I can't crack it. And I wrote a 155-page draft here just to get it out. Because this producer said, get it out. So I wrote it. And I thumped it on his desk. I go, ah, now it's your problem, right? And one of the things about this, my thing is, is the premise on it is about a dad, an overworked dad who doesn't know his son, right? And through the court, this is not Nemo. So kind of, that's all my only idea I know how to do. The, who doesn't, and through the series of events, realizes what his life is really about, blah, 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 blah. So, and I kind of, and I pitched it to Disney, 
and Disney said, we love the world, we love what you want to do, we love all this, we don't like the dad. I said, why don't you like the dad? They said, overworked dad who doesn't know his son or doesn't know the life that he's missing, we've seen it a thousand times. They said it to me in a meeting. We've seen it a thousand times. You change that, we're buying this movie. Well, that's the whole basis of my movie, <laughs> right? The idea of the overworked dad trying to do the straight line, like we start off and the, like the opening scene is, all right, we got the Henderson pitch on Monday. I got to focus and nothing can get in my way, right? And then the movie starts. All it is is things getting in his way. And then he realizes that that thing, the pitch that he was going for is not, you know, blah, blah, blah. You've got, you've, you've seen it a thousand times. But it's the perfect thing to hang the story on, right? It's the perfect thing. And they go, not going to work for us. So I have to think about, I got to change it. How do you change? And they, they go, and, you know, in my defense, I go, the reason it's, it, it, you've seen a thousand, because it works. Liar, liar, you know, all these things, they work, right? And they go, yeah, but we, right? And so everyone, if I hand it to you guys, you go, yeah, I get it, it works, I get it. See everything. Studios are going to go, no. Their jobs are to read all our scripts. And they go, oh, God, another dad who doesn't connect with his son? Oh, Christ. You know, they do that all the time. They're going to say, you guys got to change it for us because we got to put out a different movie, right? So I got to go back. And so I said, I can't do this. Or I've, I've gone, I've given you so many versions. And the producer I'm working with, I wrote three different versions, three different versions of the same movie. And then I came up with a big fat draft. Pitched all three. No. And so I said, the producer said, we need you to rewrite you. Because what I, I've been doing is I would come on somebody's script and they go, it doesn't work, elective premise, blah, blah, blah. Here's, and I would come in and rewrite it. But I'm the guy. I need another me to come in, right? So uh, we got brought in another writer. Uh, who is doing that to my thing because I got to a point where I got it out I have everything out I have every set piece you can imagine but the that spine is 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 worn and they won't take it so it's a good idea um, but anyway so it happens to everybody but the point of it is with getting back is that I put out that draft because I was afraid this is a, I'll tell all right I'll tell you the idea I'm the worst at keeping secrets. But the basic idea is, it's a guy like me in 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever, 40s. Yeah. yeah. No, but a guy uh, who has a son, a little four or five year old, and, um, and um, he loses his son's imaginary friend. He loses it. He goes, you can't find it. He's losing it. And he goes, uh, he, he thinks, what are you talking about? And he thinks that it's just crazy the kid's overreacting to this, it's going through a phase, until his imaginary friend from when he was five years old comes back and says, we gotta find that. And so he gives him the ability to see all the imaginary friends, right? So imagine doing that when you have a presentation on Monday and you can see everything. You go past the park, there's 10 kids, but now you look at it, there's 10 kids in it. Somebody has a big blue T-Rex, and somebody has a, 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 you know, has you know, a purple kangaroo that talks with a British accent. Whatever it is, so that's between you and your presentation. So Disney says, "Love it, love, love all that. Don't like this." So we have to think of a new this. So it happens. So you, ha so here's the thing: you got a good story, right, or a decent story, and you can almost see. I, oh, I can see that as a movie. Steve Carell's the dad, or whoever's. Will Ferrell's a dad, or name a guy, and you, and then you're talking to a big blue kangaroo and a and a little fairy and a goblin and a, and a monkey with a hat, and whatever. You go, got it. Just don't like what you're doing. So I've been working on it for six years, and I finally said, I love this idea. I'm willing to give. This is my own thing. Is I gave it to a, a, another writer, and I said, I'm not going to talk to you. Fix it. And so he's doing it. So. That's another way of, when you guys are writing, don't be precious about it. Because otherwise, you know, because somebody said to me, hey, how can you give away that idea to another guy? You, 
if they make it, you'll, you you know, you'll have to share credit. And I go, uh, yeah. So what? They make the movie, right? It's the greatest movie that's in my drawer, right? Or it's a movie, right? Or a short film, or whatever the hell you're making. It's like because a lot of times the, the, the writer wants to be the hero. Like you go, I can't. No, it's me or nobody. It's like, well, who's winning? Who wins that one, right? And so, like, when I was working at Pixar, or you work at Late Night with Conan O'Brien or whatever, it's like, who cares who wrote the joke that got on screen? Or the, 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 the show's, the, the, the movie's the winner, right? You do everything for the movie, right? If you're good, people will remember you. They'll know who did what. But you don't go, hey, <laughs> that whole thing with the, the joke, I, you know, what the hell's that? <laughs> like, yeah, all right, we're all on a team here. We all got our names on screen. We're all going to figure it out. But, the, but, but if you hold that back because you need to have that validation or you say, it's, I'm a, the only guy, you're not a team player. Then you've got to write a novel, write a novel or write a screenplay and then be uh, just allowed to be not produced or someone's just going to take your idea and then hire somebody to rewrite you. Okay? And that's, you know, I mean, it happens a lot. A lot of guys just don't like to give up stuff, you know? Uh, but if, if you're in a position to get something made... You're going to do whatever it takes to get it made without compromising. Like, you know, this is all with under the umbrella of I'm not going to completely give away everything. I got to have I have my point of view, but you don't want to argue everybody to death and you don't want it. But you want to be a positive force in your idea getting made, which maybe means you change the guy to a girl. You change this to that. You change the workplace comedy to something else. I said, if that's going to make it work, then who cares? I don't care. So. Because at the end of the day, you want to, everybody wants to get a movie made or a story told or a TV show sold or whatever it is. You know, I mean, there's a lot of twists that somebody just walks in and says one thing, it turns the whole thing around. You know, the movie uh, Tornado or Twister, which one? What's this? Twister. The word is that Spielberg came in and said, the girl gets in the shelter and her father gets pulled, you know, he, he just said, you make the connection to her personal. The tornado killed her father, right? If the da- if the dad gets in and blah blah, and you know, but if the dad and she sees it, he gets pulled away. Oh my God, that thing killed my dad. You're in. Now you know why she's doing it, right? But he was a, I think he was a producer or I don't whatever. But he came in, saw it, and said, she's not motivated. She's not motivated. You got to make this personal. Because otherwise, you're just a nut who chases tornado, which she was. I mean, but now she has a reason for being a nut, right? So that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to pay everything off. And the thing is, you could sit there and go, you know, I've had this story, and it's rock solid, and this and that. I go, yeah, but I don't like it. I don't, I don't care why they do it. As long as we care why the guy's going from A to B, and why he's chasing the bad guy, or why he's trying to find his son, or whatever the hell it is, if you care about that, then everyone's going to, I'm, I'm going to see what, you know, how many bad movies have we watched? I go, I just got to see how this turns out. <laughs> really? But it's horrible. I know, but they kind of hooked me in with the premise and, you know, and it's all, you know, you know what I mean? You, you just, you want to see how it turns out. Anyway. Sure. Right? Well, great family film is just, sort of why I've been talking about it, is just caring about Hey, take care. Great. Wow. We have to clear the room. I'm sorry. Okay. No. I come from a big family. You got to learn how to talk. Well, no, I'm all right. I'm okay. Uh, sure, sure. Go ahead. It's fine. I mean, like I tell you, at the, at the British one, they bring beers to the table. So I mean, I, this is all kind of tame compared to that sort of stuff. Lots of beer. Yeah, I mean, this is just filled with gin, I think. Um, what makes a great family film? I mean, it's a story that you want to follow, right? And the thing is, you can make um, The First Hangover. I'm not going to let my daughter see it, but that's a great comedy. It's an R-rated comedy, but a great family film has got to be something everybody can see. And the way, you know, at Pixar, you know, Listen, one of the things that Andrew has always said is, like, I don't make my movies for little kids. I make my movies so that little kids can see them, but I make my movies for everybody. They just happen to be animated cartoons. 
they're movies. And they, as I said before, their approach to this is, this is their, as Andrew used to say, this is our sports. This is what we're, this is what we love, right? And so he, you do a compelling story and it happens to be cute little fish and all that sort of stuff. You're following that story, but you're following it, but my six-year-old is following it and my grandmother's following it. Everybody's following that story. I mean, everybody wants a four quadrant movie. That's hard to find, right? So first of all, you gotta, your tone has got to be PG, right? All right, so then that takes a lot of things off the book, books, right? What you can say, what you can do, what you can show, the danger you can show. But, you know, when, when Nemo was released, my daughter was three, and I was invited to the premiere. And they all would bring your kids. And in the... Uh, Weeks leading up to that, my wife had taken my three-year-old daughter to some Disney movie, and the Nemo trailer was in the front. And they show it, and they show Bruce the shark, you know, some clips of Bruce. And Emma turns to my wife and just says, Mommy, we have to tell Daddy to take that shark out of the movie. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. So my wife comes home and goes, I want to think about a sitter that night for my three-year-old. Because you don't want the one of the screenwriters' daughters screaming out of the premiere. So we we um, we uh, we didn't take her. But then when it came out on DVD, the scene at the beginning, I had to sit right next to her. And then when Bruce the shark came on, they're chasing. I'm with her. I go, don't worry, he won't catch them. He won't catch them. Don't worry. And you know, like, I know how it comes up, you know, I know. And he said, he's just chasing him. I was scared. I was like, you know, so that's a three, three and a half year old, right? So, but I know other people will go, my three-year-old boy loved that. Oh my God. More sharks, more anglerfish, more danger, right? But, you know, we had people that said, you know, people all your age going on dates there to the Nemo because the story was, the story was good. You know, I was very fortunate to be, to be asked on that show. I helped it out, but I was fortunate because Andrew and those guys had come up with a story that everybody wanted to see. Everybody wanted to see. It's a rescue story. So, like, if you look at that Liam Neeson movie, was it Taken? Same thing. I mean, it's a weird version of it. It's a, he's like, you know, it's, he's like a Jason Bourne dad, you know, and his silly daughter gets taken away. But everybody goes, it's his daughter, come on, right? So I was, here, I'll tell you something. There was a, there was a situation where I was, uh, I was asked uh, at Sony to do this movie about a superhero. And it was like a, 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 a Superman character who one day there's a knock on the door and um, a, a 15 year old girl there at the door. And he goes, you know, of Superman. And, and, and he goes, hello, or whatever. He says, yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, I'm your daughter. Like that, like that. And she turns her head, and she's got laser vision and blows up a car. She goes, yeah, you got to help me with that. Like that. It's a funny idea, right? And I said, so he sat down, he started developing, and everybody loved that idea. And I said, well, wait a second. She can't be his daughter. And they go, why? Well, he's Superman, right? Yeah, that's the whole thing. He's a superpower. She goes, so that means that 16 years ago, he had sex with some woman and had a child out of wedlock and doesn't know about this girl who just shows up on his door. He's an asshole. And they go, they go, what? I said, I don't like that guy. I don't care if she gets bitten by a radioactive anything or if she gets hit by lightning or anything and becomes a superhero and comes to him and wants to be trained. Got it. Because then you can still do the father-daughter type relationship. But I, for three months, said, you can't do this. I'm telling you, people hate that guy. And they said, they they were so enamored by that, sort of that scene, I just, like, uh, get rid of this, like that. Everybody goes, oh, hilarious. I'm like, oh, my God. And everybody's got teenage daughters. I go, my daughters. I said, listen, he could take in a teenage girl and mentor her. And she could be the kind that sleeps until noon and doesn't make her bed and eats Fritos and uh, doesn't care. and. Well, doesn't want to get up and it's only on her everybody gets that everybody gets it she just can't be related to him because it ruins your whole setup 
And so uh, we had some issues about that, and they finally changed it, and then they said we don't. <laughs> then they said we don't want to do that movie. So anyway, they ended up going in a different direction with a different movie, but it came down to the premise we're talking about. You bring up your premise, and you have to research what everyone's going to see when they see your movie, because sometimes your setup is awesome. They go, but well, how did that guy get there? Well, why didn't he just do this? Because that's what we're doing when we're watching TV or movies. While you're sitting there going, don't believe it, I don't believe it. Why would he do this? Like you, you know, when you're talking to the TV screen or something, you go, I don't buy that. You buy that? I don't buy that. And you, you know, that's either bad planning on the plot, or they got stuck, or they just try to write their way out of it. You know, and sometimes, sometimes there are blockbusters that you don't care. You're just, it's on a big popcorn roller coaster ride. You go, I don't care about those things. Just let's go. You know, and you do it, and those things work. But if you're trying to do a movie that you want people to read and look at, you're gonna, they're gonna go, don't buy that. That guy says this, then he does this. You cancel each other out. So it's it's sort of like what we call story math. You just gotta make everything add up at the end. That's all you gotta do. It's all up there. You just gotta make sure your premise plays out at the end. And at the end, you gotta go, what did we what did we ask in the beginning? Like, you gotta do this or that or the other thing. Do we do that at the end? Yes, and the other thing, or no, we didn't do it. And you're like, oh, wait, we just kind of killed our whole intro. You know what I mean? And then that sort of helped, I know. Okay, well, listen, thank you for, sorry I was late today. Oh, gosh, sorry I was late. It's really, this is a great event. You guys, this is awesome to be here. Oh, stay here. Ask him how he writes action sequences. He does, he does a lot of that. He, this is cool. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he personalizes it. He personalizes it. He's, but he's a great read. Have you ever read his stuff? He's a great read. But he also is telling you a story. Right? He's telling you this great story. Well, I'm not going to tell you how he does it, but he, <laughs> he's really good. He's really good. Anyway. It was good. Oh.